Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by Dr. Ronald Brown. Our topic for today is Central Park. Sure, when you look at the picture on the right, do you remember walking through Central Park? Sort of one of the places where tourists go, New Yorkers go and walk around. Really a phenomenal construction right in the middle of the city with hills and valleys and you see two lakes there, <clears throat> open areas for playing games, but completely surrounded by a wall of concrete buildings. Well, most people walk around Central Park and they never really pay much attention. They don't know much of the history of the park, the controversy surrounding it, and what a great, terrible job it was to design and to construct this park. So today we are going to be exploring Central Park, not by walking around and seeing the squirrels and the other animals and the birds and the tourists and the uh, robbers and everybody else that hangs out in the park, but we're going to be going back into the history of the park. Why was the park built? What does it mean? What did it represent to Americans when it was being built back during and after the Civil War? So let's get started. <clears throat> Once again, we see the outline. Number one, Thomas Cole, who was the spiritual father of Central Park. Point two, the rich, all the people who made a fortune during the Civil War wanted to leave their mark on the city and they had the money to do it. So Fifth Avenue emerged as the street of the wealthy and Fifth Avenue was filled with everything the rich people could possibly want. But there was one thing lacking, and that was a magnificent park. New York did not have parks. Why didn't we have parks? Why do all the great cities of Europe have magnificent parks? But the cities of the United States, and especially New York City, had no park. And then point five, <clears throat> the evolution of the park from a playground for the rich and fabulous to a park for the people. So let's get going. <coughs> well, here we see a picture of Thomas Cole. Thomas Cole was born in Britain, came to the United States, 1818, died 1848, very young man, 47. One of these people, you'll wonder if he had lived another 50 years, what other magnificent parks and what other magnificent paintings could he have given us? Well, he was born in Britain, came to the United States, and made New York his home. He was a painter. <coughs> he was painting pictures of the landscape of America. In fact, he developed a theory that the United States was a new Garden of Eden, and that is the title of his picture, which you see on the screen. Well, there was palm trees, and there were people, and lakes, and animals, and it was really a wonderful interpretation of the United States. <clears throat> I know my mother's ancestors were coming over at the same time that Thomas Cole was painting. <clears throat> well, they weren't pondering the beauties of nature. They were buying wagons and horses and cattle and plows and marching off to the new west, the Louisiana Purchase and going up, chopping down trees, killing the Indians and taming <clears throat> the land. So they were more interested in making a living and being successful in their new country. Whereas for Thomas Cole, nature 
the landscape was more than just pretty, um, pretty scenes like we see in the picture. It had a power of nature. Well, the power of nature, according to Thomas Cole, was that when all of these immigrants were coming over, the Dutch, the English, Sephardic Jews, African slaves, Indians who were here, the Irish Catholics, German Christians, Lutherans and Protestants, and later German Jews, all of these immigrants pouring into this new and constantly growing country were going to be transformed by the landscape. That as my mother's ancestors trekked across Pennsylvania and up into the upper Midwest, they were interacting with nature, probably in the same wagon trains where Irish Catholics coming over. Maybe there were Dutch and English new arrivals who were looking for new farmland to set up homes, raise families. And so what united all of these new immigrants was the nature. No matter what your background, <clears throat> when you came to a beautiful mountain, everybody stopped and said, why, wow, isn't that a beautiful scene? We don't have scenes like that back in England or Germany or France or Scotland or Ireland or wherever they were coming from. When they came to a river, the Mississippi, there were no bridges across. They had to work together to build ships, to build boats, to transport them and their families and their animals and their wagons across the mighty Mississippi and continue chopping down trees to make brand new roads. <coughs> so the nature, the challenges of nature, the beauty of nature, the thrill of nature united these people. And according to Thomas Cole, they would create a new people so that these Irish Catholic immigrants, these German Catholic immigrants, the German Jews, the Native Americans, the English, the Dutch, all these other immigrants pouring into the United States in the early 1800s <clears throat> would intermarry. They would blend together. They would learn English. They would build towns. They would build houses of worship. They would educate their kids in schools. And so it was interacting with this new land that would unite all of these new immigrants pouring into the country and create from them a new Adam and a new Eve. So that's why Thomas Cole called America a Garden of Eden, a new Garden of Eden. Humanity would be created again. And Irish Catholic and Irish Protestants would work together and overcome their differences. <clears throat> and so this was Thomas Cole's vision of American history. The power of nature, the landscape, was more than just pretty scenes, but it was transforming these immigrants into a new race, which he called the Americans. Well, Thomas Cole lived in New York, even though he traveled in upstate New York and New Jersey and Long Island, but he was a New Yorker. When Thomas Cole was in New York, you can see the map on the left. Uh, you see the growth of New York from the very bottom where the Dutch had their colony going up Broadway <clears throat> and gradually starting to fill up Manhattan. Well, when Thomas Cole was here, the population was barely 200,000. But by the time of the Civil War, the city had reached a million. The grid plan, that street and avenue intersecting at right angles, which is so typical of the city, was already in place. So that when new immigrants settled in New York, 
They had the streets and the avenues. They had addresses to build their homes and to gradually spread up Manhattan. Well, all was not well in this growing city. <clears throat> in the west where my mother's family went, they could find a valley, chop down the trees, chase away or kill the Indians, build a house, make a farm, and maybe the next neighbor would be a mile away. But they would gather once a week to a marketplace where one farmer made cheese and the other one had meat from a deer that he had shot. Well, they would exchange and then they would go back home and <clears throat> create new families. Well, in New York City, all of these new immigrants came in. Well, many of them were simple farmers from Germany or England or Scotland or Ireland or Holland. They didn't know how to live in cities. They had never lived in a city. <clears throat> so they ended up being dumped in slums. Later on, they would build what we call tenements, like we see in the picture on the right. Five points area in lower Manhattan was the most dangerous place in the city. It's a wonderful movie describing this period called The Gangs of New York with Leonardo DiCaprio, Daniel Day-Lewis, and Cameron Diaz. Describing the gang warfares <clears throat> where the German Catholics would be battling with the Irish Catholics. The Irish would be battling with African Americans. Everybody was doing what they could to survive in this booming, slum-ridden city. And look at, look at the streets. I mean, they're filled with horses, mobs of people. Maybe a family had one room somewhere. Well, <clears throat> the kids, as soon as they got up and had something to drink or maybe something to eat if they could find it, they were dumped on the streets while the men went looking for jobs and the women were taking care of the new babies, which were constantly arriving. So New York was a pretty wild place. <clears throat> Fierce racism. Everybody hated the Irish Catholics because they were uneducated. They usually couldn't even speak English. The Germans were looked down upon. They didn't speak English, even if they come over and had some money and were hard working. They were still looked down upon by the old English and Dutch families who considered them invading their New York. Thomas Nast, himself a German immigrant, made the drawing which we see on the screen. <clears throat> in the upper left-hand corner, you see the Vatican in Rome. And the Pope is ordering German and Irish Catholics to invade New York and America. And so you see them crawling out of the river. They look like crocodiles, but if you look closely, they look like Catholic bishops with their crowns on their heads. And you see Thomas Nast protecting or trying to protect the good New York Protestants from these hordes of dirty Jews and dirty Catholics and Irish and Germans who don't even speak English flooding into the city. So New York was a pretty wild place. Clearly, these immigrants were not interacting with nature. They were not intermarrying and creating a new nationality. The Irish Catholics were building Catholic churches and schools and orphanages and hospitals to protect the Irish from these terrible Protestants and Jews. And the Jews, the German Jews, were building their synagogues and their yeshivas and their neighborhoods to protect these Jews from being infected with diseases from these immigrant Catholics and Protestants. So New York was a vicious city at the time of Thomas Cole. There was no interacting with nature in the wild streets of 
Lower Manhattan, Hell's Kitchen, slum, all new immigrants. They had wagons that went around every morning to pick up the bodies of the dead who had been murdered or who had died of disease or had died of poverty, literally in the streets. So Thomas Cole was painting beautiful scenes. On the right, you see a cabin in the woods and a family chopping down trees, making a farm, producing kids, drinking fresh water from the river, eating fresh meat from their animals that they would shoot, eating fresh eggs from the chicken, eating the fresh vegetables that they themselves had grown intermarrying with their neighbors, working collectively. <clears throat> In the upper picture, we see his view of New York City. See the Hudson River in the distance uh, and the Atlantic Ocean. And you see all of these immigrants interacting with nature. The bottom left-hand corner, there's a man drawing geometric figures in the ground. You had hunters on sol and soldiers. You had people in the middle of the picture taking care of their flocks. Even in the right-hand side, you see a man and a woman dancing and playing music. Well, this type of world <clears throat> was far from the reality that the average New Yorker was encountering. They were dumped in the slums and died of disease and crime and afflicted with racism and every other type of terrible um, feature of New York City at that time. <clears throat> but Thomas Cole was an optimist. Here we see his culmination of empire, one of the most famous paintings. This painting is the size of a wall, it hangs in the New York Historical Society, where I was a tour guide for many years. This is Thomas Cole's vision of New York City of the future. See the um, Hudson River in the distance, you see the Atlantic Ocean, and you see all the wealthy people, the boats bringing in imports and exports. Uh, you see crossing the bridge at the bottom, a general coming back from victory in a war, making New York even richer. Well, you might say <clears throat> that doesn't look much like New York in the 1830s and 1820s. Well, don't forget. The United States was building its brand new capital city, Washington, D.C., at that time. And what is the architecture of Washington, D.C.? It's all Greek and Roman architecture. So when Thomas Cole made his vision of a future New York, he was right on target. The United States was the new Greek and Roman empire of the world. People would become wealthy. Well, this is a far cry from the reality of New York at the time of Thomas Cole. <clears throat> well, shortly after Thomas Cole died in 1848, relations between the North and the South of the United States started deteriorating, and eventually war would break out. Well, New York, as we saw, began in Lower Manhattan, and we can see the map of New Amsterdam with the wall going up and down. Today, that's Wall Street, and you see Broadway going to the right and to the left through the gate and up into Manhattan. Gradually, the city started growing. <clears throat> Look at the map of 1807. The dark area at the bottom was New York City, as Thomas Cole would know it, the dark area of Manhattan. Gradually, the city was being filled in with streets and avenues. Well, if you look closely at this picture of 1807, you see a white area in the middle. That wasn't a park. That was where the 
National Guard, the soldiers of New York State, would go and do their drills and shooting. In this plan of 1807, there were a couple of little parks, but the city fathers, uh, DeWitt Clinton at the time, who was mayor and then later governor, saw why waste good Manhattan real estate on stupid parks. It's worth money. Sell it off to people like John Jacob Astor, who will turn it into houses and apartment buildings and make a lot of money. Well, New York boomed during the Civil War. <clears throat> we see textile factories in New York making uniforms for soldiers, making shoes for soldiers, for uniforms and everything else they needed to go marching off to war. New York along the East River was filled with factories, smokestacks burning coal, running the machines to run the textile factories, to make steel for the railroads, as you can see in the bottom picture on the left, the old steam engine chugging down. Because during a war, you needed more than uniforms, you needed guns, you needed cannons, you needed railroads. And if you're building railroads, you need railroad bridges. And so New York became the number one industrial city, long before cities like Pittsburgh and Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland were industrial cities. New York was filled with factories. And people said that during the Civil War, the air was so with coal dust and pollution, that people were actually wearing masks <clears throat> like they do today because of the COVID-19. Uh, well, they weren't wearing masks because of COVID. They were wearing masks because of the pollution. People like John Jacob Astor, who became the United States' first multimillionaire, were followed by people like Commodore Vanderbilt, who made a fortune during the Civil War. He was called Commodore because he built ships which were necessary for the war effort, first exporting food and meat from his farm in Staten Island to New York City. And then later, a fleet of ships darting back and forth between Queens and Brooklyn and Staten Island and New Jersey and Manhattan and the whole way up to the Bronx. All of these soldiers gathering in New York City to be trained and then to march off for war needed food. They needed uniforms. And so people like Vanderbilt Cornelius Vanderbilt was his first name, became one of the wealthiest men in America because of the war effort. Carolyn Webster Shemmerhorn Astor, who was a young woman during the Civil War, a descendant of John Jacob Astor, I think it's his daughter, was so wealthy that she built this giant mansion on Fifth Avenue. The New Yorkers, when they started making money, they wanted to found their own ethnic neighborhood where only rich people could live. Well, they couldn't pass laws saying Catholics can't live there or something like that, but they could price everybody else out of the neighborhood. So we see her house here, a giant mansion where she lived and entertained. Well, she was in many ways the mother of the New York elite, the upper class, the aristocrats. I mean, look at her picture. She's not a happy, smiley, huggy type of woman. She was a dictator, she was a tyrant, and she decided who could live on Fifth Avenue. She decided who could dance in her ballroom. 
who could have dinner in her dining room. And if you were not invited by Mrs. Shemmerhorn to her annual Christmas party or dinner or dances, you were nobody in New York. She had her list of 400 people. And these were the city's elite. No Jews were allowed. No Catholics were allowed, only good European Protestants. Well, actually, at one point, the story goes, she did permit two Catholic girls to be invited to her dances. But, the story goes, they had to sign an agreement that if they were invited to Mrs. Astor's home for events, they would promise to marry a Protestant and raise the children as good Protestants. Well, this was her list. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, you see Mrs. Astor's New York. See that building on the right with the towers on it? That was the first Fifth Avenue Temple Emmanuel. This was a German Jewish synagogue, reform synagogue. Only German speaking Jews could be admitted. None of these straggly haired and big hats from Eastern Europe, these Orthodox Jews. No Sephardic Jews were permitted. No Bukharians from Central Asia and all these dark skinned people. These were blonde hair, blue eyed German Jews who built the first Temple Emmanuel. Well, even though they had their Fifth Avenue house of worship, they were still not welcome in Mrs. Astor's dance hall, her dining room, or her class of 400 people. This period following the Civil War was called the Gilded Age. People made money. A.T. Stewart Mansion, which you see in the picture on the left, uh, built 1869, right at the end of the Civil War at Fifth Avenue and 34th Street. He was the one who invented the department store so that you didn't have to go to the coffee store. You didn't have to go to the hat store. You didn't have to go to the boot store. You didn't have to go to the bakery shop running from place to place to do your shopping. He built a giant department store in lower Manhattan where women of quality could go in. They could have tea. They could do all of their shopping under one roof with their servants taking the hats and the cakes and everything else that they bought and taking them out, putting them in the carriages and then taking the ladies home. Gilded in English means covered with gold. Today we say something is gold plated, meaning who knows what kind of metal is underneath it, but it has a nice thin layer of gold on the surface. And that's where the people like the Astors and the Vanderbilts, who were basically ordinary people like A.T. Stewart, an immigrant from Ireland, Protestant Northern Ireland, who became fabulously wealthy during the Civil War and built his Fifth Avenue mansion. On the right, you see two identical mansions. This is part of Vanderbilt Row where Cornelius Vanderbilt, every time one of his kids would get married, he'd build them a mansion along Fifth Avenue. Well, Fifth Avenue became the avenue of the wealthy. My mother's cousin came to New York from Pennsylvania, fabulously wealthy, worth millions. But since he was Catholic, He was not allowed to build his mansion on Fifth Avenue. He had to build it up on Riverside Drive. 
His name was Charles M. Schwab, not Charles Schwab of the investment bankers today. My mother's cousin was the president of a steel company in Pennsylvania. And he was boycotted by Mrs. Astor, by the other wealthy Protestants of Fifth Avenue. So Fifth Avenue began being filled up with mansions. Some were huge, like Mrs. Astor's mansion on the left, but many of them, which still exist, as you can see in the picture on the right, there are a couple mansions there. There are three, which are surrounded by more modern buildings. And so if you look at Fifth Avenue today, it's all skyscrapers and apartment buildings, but following the Civil War, it was filled with the mansions. Well, these rich people who were building Fifth Avenue wanted to make New York City into a city that would be more beautiful than Paris or London or Madrid or Rome or St. Petersburg in Russia. They wanted to make New York City a world class city. Well, they set out to do that by making Fifth Avenue an avenue that would be the most beautiful and luxurious in the world. Some of these mansions still remain. Here we see two of them. Um, the plant mansion on the right was a later rival. Beside it, you see a white building just behind the bus. That is one of the Vanderbilt mansions, which still is there. But you can see behind these two survivors is a giant glass tower, meaning most of the mansions are gone. On the left, you see another one with the red bricks and the beautiful roof and everything. Well, this is up closer to the Metropolitan Museum, and it has also managed to survive. But don't forget, each of these mansions was a one-family house. The top floor, on the right picture, you see the little tiny square windows way up in the top. That's where the girl servants lived, so that they could come down at any time of day, make coffee for the family, or take care of the kids, or do anything that was required of them. Well, the first step in making Fifth Avenue a magnificent street, the most beautiful in the world, was, of course, to build houses of worship. Already before the Civil War, the wealthy were beginning to cluster in Lower Fifth Avenue. 10th and 11th Streets in the 1840s, we saw Ascension Episcopal Church, Church of England, First Presbyterian, the Church of Scotland, Shortly before the Civil War, St. Patrick's Cathedral was built by the Irish Catholics. And right after the Civil War, the very first Temple Emmanuel for the German Reformed Jews was built. So if you look at the picture on the right, you see mansions and you see the two churches. Those are Ascension and First Presbyterian, but with mansions in between. Today, when you go there, you're going to see, you know, 100 story buildings making the church towers look like nothing in comparison. But back in the years of the Civil War and after, there were no skyscrapers. So Fifth Avenue was dominated by the towers of churches. Patrick's Cathedral, the Catholics are even there, and Temple Emmanuel um, at 43rd Street. Well, they began building luxury stores and hotels. On the left, you see the Peninsula Hotel. Well, the hotel was important because that is where the wealthy went for tea in the morning, for big banquets, for weddings, for graduations and the big events of the wealthy were held in these magnificent uh, um, hotels. 
Tiffany store moved to Fifth Avenue and made the items of beauty and luxury for the wealthy fifth class group. On the right, you see the famous Palm Court. This is in the Plaza Hotel, where once again, the wealthy would gather for tea. You may know the Plaza Hotel. It was um, Home Alone 2 was filmed there, and a lot of other famous movies were made in the Plaza Hotel. Well, the wealthy also built private clubs. You see the Union Club at the bottom. You see the Yacht Club. A yacht means a boat for the wealthy. And you can see the windows in the Yacht Club is built like a boat. On the right, you see the Yacht Club. Now, to be a member of the Yacht Club, you had to have a boat. You had to have a staff to take care of your yacht. And so you not only were invited to join the club if your yacht was big and expensive enough, but you had to maintain a harbor. You had to take care of the ship, which sometimes you would only use a couple months in the summer, but yet it was a sign of luxury. Now the private clubs, you could not apply to join. You were invited by members. You were grilled, asking you questions. How much money do you have? How big is your yacht? What universities did you go to? Where is your mansion on Fifth Avenue? And it was something very, very difficult to get into. <clears throat> The wealthy started building monumental public buildings. On the left, you see the Metropolitan Museum on Fifth Avenue. On the right, you see the New York Public Library at 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue with the famous lions in front. If you look at the uh, library, you see these statues. These were the wealthy Fifth Avenue multimillionaires who donated their private libraries and lots of money to build this beautiful building, considered by many to be one of the most beautiful libraries in the world. So New York wealthy elite was building their perfect city along Fifth Avenue filled with houses of worship, mansions, public buildings, hotels, private clubs, beautiful shopping areas. New York was on its way to becoming the most beautiful city in the world. But there was one thing that was lacking, and that is a park. Well, Anybody who has traveled in Europe knows that giant, beautiful parks are a distinguishing feature of every city in Europe. On the left, you see the gardens of Versailles. You see the palace, the gardens in front, the big boulevards going off in each direction with fountains in the front. The most, many people say, beautiful garden in the world. When Peter the Great made this new capital, St. Petersburg, of course, he built his palace and fountains and trees and canals, big stairways, statues. Well, all of these big European parks, as you can see, were associated with kings. Louis XIV, the Sun King, built Versailles and its gardens. Peter the Great built St. Petersburg and its palaces and gardens. So all of these magnificent parks, which were built by kings, made the European cities so beautiful. 
In Paris, my favorite park is the Jardin de Luxembourg. You see the palace in the right and the gardens going down behind with their fountains, their trees, their walkways. One of the most beautiful parks in the world. But once again, built by a king, built by a prince, built by an emperor or a queen. All of the great parks of Europe are associated with a palace, whether it is Rome, Madrid, Barcelona, Berlin, Munich, Vienna, all of these great palaces were adorned with gardens. Now, very often, the king or the prince would allow the well-to-do of the city to visit their private parks, their private gardens, on maybe a Sunday or some other day during the week or for a holiday, they would be open to the public. <clears throat> well, the person who decided that it was time for New York City to have a big, beautiful park were two people named Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vokes. They started floating the idea of a big park. Well, a politician, Andrew Haswell Green, who was considered one of the great fathers of beautiful New York, thought the idea was exactly what New York needed. In fact, Andrew Haswell Green is called the father of New York City because he also came up with the idea of uniting Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan, and the Bronx, and consolidating them into one city. So he was not only the father of Central Park, but he was also the father of what we call Greater New York, which we have today. Well, both Frederick Olmsted and Calvert Vox had traveled in Europe and they had visited all the great parks of Europe. And so when Andrew Haswell Green thought that was a good idea to build a park in New York, well, the next step was what kind of park were they going to build? In Europe, there were two kinds of parks. On the left, you see the French park. This is the Palace of Versailles. And if you draw a line down the middle of the picture, you'll see that each side is almost identical. The palace, 50% is on the right, 50% is on the left, they are identical. You have a big open area with fountains, same on both sides. An avenue with green grass and trees, same on both sides. And further afield, you see a cluster of fountains. If there's a fountain on the right, there's going to be a fountain on the left. Coming the whole way down to a fountain, and again, walkway on both sides. This is called geometric. Everything is straight lines, circles, rectangles perfectly balanced on both sides. That's the French garden. The English garden was much more of a wild, rustic garden, such as the one on the right. Nothing is geometric. The trees are planted, a cluster here and a cluster there. The little bridge goes across a creek, which is not straight. It just wanders around. In the distance, you see a forest with a little pavilion up on the hill. It is natural. Even if it is artificial, it is natural. The trees grow the way they want to grow. In the French park, you're going around cutting the trees so that they'll be square, cutting the hedge, cutting the grass to make it grow the way you want it. If there's a flower on one side, there has to be a flower on the other side. But the English parks were natural. So Vaux and Olmsted had to decide which were they going to build. 
A lot of the rich people say, oh, we want a French part. A lot of the other people said, no, we want an English part. So this was a big problem. Well, in the end, as we're going to see, Central Park has French areas and it has English areas. It was a compromise. Well, the designers of the park, which was founded officially in 1857, just before the war and built during the war and well after the war, going up into almost 1900, the park was built by the rich who financed it, and it was for the rich. It was not a park for the people. In fact, through most of its history, these gates, here you see the Scholar's Gate, where I always go in with my groups to take a walk. Well, there would be a policeman there. Are you appropriately dressed? Do not walk on the, on the grass. Do not sit on the grass. You could take no food in the park. The park was closed on Sunday because good people should be in church on Sunday, not roaming through the park. So it was bordering on Fifth Avenue, but it was a park by the rich and for the rich. The common way of visiting the park was to get in a carriage. Now, of course, the super wealthy had their own carriages, whereas the less wealthy could rent a personal carriage or they could get into a carriage like this, which was, uh, you know, nicely well-dressed people who got to know each other. But what kind of carriage you had really determined who you were. And of course, every horse had to be groomed. You had to have a driver and it was a place for rich families to show off their beautiful daughter or for rich families to present their handsome son who had just graduated from Harvard so that rich people would marry rich people, keep the money in the family. Well, the park, we can see on the left, the way it looks today, goes from uh, 96th Street, uh, or, or from, uh, from 110th Street, way up in the top, to 59th Street at the bottom, between 5th Avenue and 8th Avenue. Well, it was begun in the 1850s, more or less completed in 1873 when it reached 110th Street, but it was a work in progress because the area really was, there was not much there. There were a couple little villages there. There was an orphanage at one point, uh, but the trees had long been chopped down for firewood for the families. So you get a pic uh, image on the right of the scene where you see the lakes, but it's all open land because all the trees in Central Park were planted by Volks and Olmsted. Uh, and of course, it took them years to grow. Now, if you look at the pathways and the lakes and everything, it's definitely an English garden. The paths curve and wind around. The lake is irregular. But in the very middle of the picture, you see some long, straight rows of trees. That is the French part of the garden. Geometric, two rows of trees on the right, Two rows of trees on the left, a statue on the right, a statue on the left. And we're going to visit both of those parts. Now, the overall design was a British garden. The Ramble, very famous area. You can see the paths go to the right and to the left. The trees are growing the way they grow. If a tree falls over in a storm, it's left there. The bugs take over the tree and the birds start eating the bugs. And so you have all kinds of animals roaming around. The Belvedere Castle built in 1867 is on a high point, the highest point in the park. Whenever they say that it is 
65 degrees in Central Park. That is the temperature at the Belvedere. In fact, just beside the Belvedere, there is a giant area where they measure the wind speed. They measure how much snow, how much rain, the temperature at each time of day. And that's a beautiful area. Now, below that, you can see the lake. It's a turtle pond, thousands of turtles, some of them as big as a small automobile, swim in there. They have an island in the middle so the ducks can go over and have their babies and not be attacked by dogs or cats or, or raccoons. So it looks very English. Famous Bow Bridge, the lake with the boathouse in the distance uh, um, uh, were features of the park. So once again, you see every season, the temperatures change, the leaves turn red, they fall, it gets winter. In the spring, you see the tulips and the hyacinths. So it's a very natural looking park. Well, there is the French part, and this is called the mall. Look at the picture on the left. You see the sheep meadow where they had thousands of sheep because the sheep had to go around and eat the grass. They didn't have lawn mowers at the Civil War time. So everybody had students from Columbia or someplace would go. They'd be given a 20, 30 sheep for the day, take them off to some area and the sheep would eat the grass. Well, there is the French part and you can see the band shell, Bethesda fountain leading up to the lake and the long straight mall. Well, that's the only straight line in the whole map. Everything else is curving, everything is British. Even the lake is irregular shaped. On the right, you see the mall. This is a, um, a rain and winter shot. And you can see if there's a statue on one side, there's another statue on the other side. The benches are in a straight line. This is typically French. Statues, you see Christopher Columbus, you see the statue of Beethoven covered in snow. These are all along the mall. At the end of the mall, you get to the Bethesda fountain overlooking the lake and in the distance, the boathouse. This was a fountain designed by one of the few women who was involved in Central Park, Emma Stebbins in 1873. There's a famous story in the Christian Bible that there is a, uh, a uh, pond in Jerusalem. And the story goes that every once in a while, an angel will come out of heaven and fly over the pond, and when its wing touches the water, the first person into the water will be healed of a terrible disease. And so that is the English part. Once again, it is geometric. You see a round pond with a statue in the middle. But then in the distance, you see the natural part. That's the rambles. You can see it's a winter sh shot or an early spring shot, actually, I think. With the boathouse in the distance, you can rent boats and you have weddings and events at the boathouse. Well, Thomas Cole's idea of using the park to recreate nature in the middle of a big city was realized. Here again, we see the sheep meadow. And in the distance, you see somebody riding by in their carriage and uh, there are other people walking. Well, the sheep ate the grass and the people who took care of the sheep would collect the sheep poop and they would use that as fertilizer for the flowers and the plants. On the right, you see the dairy barn where they had real live cows, they would milk the cows, and you could take children in and for a penny, they would get a nice warm cup of milk fresh out of the cow. 
I mean, I often think today how many kids uh, don't even know where milk comes from. If you ask them, they say it comes from a plastic bottle in the grocery store. And they would be shocked to find out that milk actually comes from a cow. But this was Thomas Cole's idea to bring nature into the city, even though it was restricted to the wealthy in the beginning. But gradually, the ordinary people started getting more and more access, and eventually was even open on Sunday, so that even people who worked six days a week could theoretically go to church in the morning, but then spend the afternoon walking around the park. The zoo was the, or one of the early features of the park dating back to the 1860s. You see the Delacorte clock, whereas every hour and I think half hour, the animals go dancing around and the monkeys up on the top hit the bell with their hammers. Now this is generally a children's zoo. So every spring when a polar bear like the one on the right has a baby, after the baby is a little bit grown up, they bring the mom and the baby down and put it in the zoo. And you have one entire area devoted to birds, another one devoted to water animals. You have the polar bear. Recently, Gus, who was the star polar bear for many, many years, uh, passed away. And so um, uh, he was a great one to see going up under the rocks and then jumping into the water and swimming around and really an absolute thrill for everybody. Well, gradually the wealthy people started losing control of the park and you could walk on the grass. They started having benches. They started having places where you could buy something to eat, or you could buy food or coffee or even a beer. You're not allowed to drink alcohol in the park. But the trick is uh, I get a plastic Coca-Cola bottle and I fill it with red wine because red wine and Coca-Cola have about the same color. So I can be sitting on a park bench or under a tree up in the rambles, and I can be having my drink of uh, red wine. And um, even if somebody suspects it, they're not going to say anything. Well, the Shakespeare Theater, which you see on the left, uh, is a free theater. It overlooks the Turtle Pond. And the view which we have here, for, and the picture is taken from the Belvedere Castle. Well, in the distance, you see some of the tall buildings which were gradually built along 8th Avenue. When the park was open, there was nothing around it. Uh, but gradually, um, the area, especially along 5th Avenue, became a very expensive street and everybody wanted to have a view of Central Park. Well, the Shakespeare Garden is, was traditionally devoted just to Shakespeare's plays. And on the right, you see the Shakespeare Garden. Every plant that Shakespeare mentions in his plays or his sonnets is in this garden. And so you walk around and unless people steal them, you see a little sign that says, oh, this is this particular flower that he mentions in this particular sonnet or in this particular play. The Boathouse has three restaurants, super expensive, medium expensive, and uh, picture on the right, the outdoor cafe where you could get a cup of coffee for a reasonable price. In the boathouse, once again, you can see the tall skyscrapers that have been growing up around the park. This is the lake and you can rent rowboats. They have a giant gondola. Very nice to see that when a wedding is there and you see the bride and the groom sitting in the gondola and boats going around and everybody snapping pictures. On the right is one of the sheep, which they don't have there anymore. 
Now they have big mechanical lawn mowers. So I guess the sheep are now in a retirement community for old sheep, probably somewhere in upstate New York. This is again the Belvedere, um, uh, uh, the Bethesda fountain. And you can see and the, and behind it, you see two stairways going down. Once again, it's the French style garden, nicely balanced. Well, in the spring around the Bethesda fountain, there are cherry trees and apple trees and other uh, trees, which just burst into blossom. And it is very popular for foreign tourists to come to New York, especially Asians, to have their wedding in New York. <coughs> Sometimes it'll be at a church, and then they come to Central Park to have their pictures taken. I've seen actual weddings taking place in Central Park and around the Bethesda Fountain is one of the most popular places. Then they can process up to the boathouse, which is just up the corner, go for a ride in the gondola, and then very often have a beautiful dinner. I was taking a group of students through Central Park. We walked in front of the boathouse to go up to the Rambles, and we saw that there was a wedding party going on in one of the halls. Well, they had big tables out before at the entranceway with on one side white wine and on the other side red wine. So I just told, no, nobody was there. So I just told my students, I'll go out and have a free glass of wine. So we were there all drinking a glass of wine when suddenly the people who were running the affair came up and let's say they said some words which I shouldn't repeat uh, and told us to get the hell out of there that we were stealing their wine. And of course I argued and said, well, it was here, it was on tables, it looked like it was free. So. We not only got a wonderful view of a wedding and a day in the park, but we got a free glass of wine. Well, there is a second area that was added later, which is in the style of the French garden. And that is further up at about the 90s uh, along Fifth Avenue. And this is the famous Conservancy Garden. Probably one of the most intensive areas of flowers in New York City. Once again, you can see it's French style. Picture on the left, you see that there's a row of white flowers and then a row of purple flowers. There's a little monument on the right. There's another monument very similar on the left. In the um, picture on the right, you can see a round area with a little statue with tulips, which means it was a springtime. You can see the green trees have very pale green. They have just gotten their leaves. And this dates from 1937. It's a later um, addition to the park. A very famous place is the Dakota Hotel or Dakota Apartment Building, which you see at the bottom in the middle, that is where John Lennon and Yoko Ono lived and their son was born and grew up there. And it was in the lobby of that building on December 8th in 1980 that John Lennon was assassinated. So just across 8th Avenue in the park, to commemorate John Lennon, a memorial was built with Imagine, one of his most famous songs in mosaics on the ground and benches around it and a very popular area for tourists who have fond memories of the Beatles. <clears throat> In recent years, as the park has become more and more of a people's park, various individuals have sponsored playgrounds for kids, uh, such as the one in the upper left, uh, which is right near 8th Avenue. 
Below that, you see an area for playing bocce or patank in French, the lawn bowling. And on the right, they now have baseball diamonds. Once again, look at the skyscrapers surrounding the park more and more. So it has become more and more of a people's park. It is rather popular. Uh, the Rambles is the wildest area, and there are many areas there where the city authorities permit nude sunbathing during the summer, but they're off of the path. You have to know where they are. Um, there are areas where you walk around and you see everybody is smoking pot and the police just don't bother. So you can sit down on a bench beside some people who are smoking pot and you don't even have to buy it. It's just uh, you can smell it for miles away. But it has become generally a very um, pleasant park with a lot of activities. Now, this was not the case in the 60s and 70s. The park had really seriously deteriorated. But now it is again being restored and it is safe, although I wouldn't advise you walking around in the middle of the night, but um, especially not alone. And there are every summer there are crimes and robberies. In fact, I was there once and witnessed a woman being robbed um, in the park, but generally it is safe. <clears throat> A lot of famous events uh, take place. You see the flags, which was an installation. I think he was a French um, artist who put up the flags. Uh, the Dalai Lama had his big sermon and his big events in the park. You see all of the people there. Um, concert in the park, Simon and Garfunkel, many concerts uh, at the holiday season, Christmas and Hanukkah. You have the famous Hanukkah on ice, where uh, they, the woman ice skating rink at the bottom of Manhattan um, is a very famous place for Hanukkah celebrations, famous Hanukkah on ice. So we have seen that Central Park has a fascinating history behind it. It began as a effort by the rich to make New York a world-class city, which it succeeded and is now a popular people's park. So this is Dr. Ronald Brown logging off. And as you can see, I'm not just a great historian of New York City, but I am a historian of the great cities of the world I've lived in probably 30 or 40 great cities of the world uh, and spend every August in Paris. In fact, as I'm speaking to you, I'm getting ready to go to Mexico City for the month of January. So if any of you uh, would like to contact me, ronbrownmedia at gmail.com and uh, suggestions, criticisms, additions, anything you have to share with me, I'd love to hear. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for joining me. And I hope to see you sometime in the future for another exciting lecture on some fascinating topic. So this is Dr. Ronald Brown logging off. Thank you for joining me. And I hope to see you again in the future.